bonjour. Uh, good to see everyone here today. I'm excited to be in Paris. And hopefully some of you will be invited and excited to come to San Diego. Uh, so I was asked to speak on a topic that I'm quite passionate about. Any of you who work in mental health and addiction know we fight stigma every day. Could you imagine there's a group of people in America that live 26 years shorter lifespan than every other American? They have the biggest health disparity in America. So instead of living 78 years, they live 52. What should we do? Sadly, not much is being done to address this problem. That's people with serious mental illness in America. And the reason they die is not from suicide, not from their psychiatric disorder, but because we didn't prevent the medical illnesses they get from smoking. Now in America, we've addressed tobacco through prevention in many ways, very successfully. In California, only 12% of the population smoke. In the 50s, 60% of men in America smoke. 50% of doctors smoke, so we're now down to 12. But if you walk on the streets of San Diego and you see someone smoking, flip a coin, they're mentally ill. We have not helped people with mental illness to quit smoking. So now we have two stigmas if you're a smoker. No disclosures financially a bunch of research grants and other activities. So I, I'm very curious to your questions. I wish we had an hour so I could hear all of your questions. Uh, but why should we do this? How would we do this? Think of the program you're in. I've worked, I'm an addiction psychiatrist. I've worked in methadone settings. I've worked in early work of buprenorphine in the early 90s. I've worked with schizophrenia, any, everything in mental health and addiction. How do we address the barriers to smoking? How do you make change? Think of the organization you're in. Maybe there was a big change somewhere in the past. There used to be addiction programs that didn't offer psychiatric treatment, that didn't offer medication, that didn't use agonist medication. There are many things that we've overcome, including even an electronic health record which many are still kicking and screaming about. So I'll describe the model that we're using on addressing tobacco through organizational change. One of the things I think lacking in healthcare in America is having clear methods with which to change the culture. And it is a cultural issue in mental health and addiction settings to not address smoking. So these high rates are not only in America, they're in all over the globe. The UK had a major report on smoking amongst those with mental health and addiction a couple years ago. So there are many studies across the globe. There may be some differences by gender. Asia, Asian countries are very much like America in the 50s, where the men smoke and the women don't. And then we had Virginia Slims and uh, women going to work in the US and now it's equal rights. Everybody has the same smoking rate. So in American settings, depending on what setting you're in, outpatient general mental health, behavioral health is the lowest at 50%. But if you go on inpatient units or methadone, you're approaching 95% of patients smoking. Depending on those units, you also have differences with staff smoking. 50% of doctors used to smoke in America. Now, 3%. It's easier to say you, smoke, you uh, do cocaine as a doctor than it is to smoke a cigarette. How your peers will look at you. 
effect of the pure uh, impact that you describe. Obviously, the reason we think about smoking is because of the health consequences that are so clear. Cardiac disease, pulmonary disease, cancers, but many other factors. Things that patients worry about. Impotence, diabetes, poor wound healing, wrinkles, bad breath, less relationship options, less likelihood to get a job. Those are all factors associated with smoking. It, uh, in America, people on fixed income, it's about a quarter of their income goes up in smoke, where they may be able to use those funds for something else. Also, the staff. This is one of my best leverages with CEOs of hospitals. I thank them for the 17-day a year uh, holiday they give to smokers while they're working. Studies have looked at how long smoke breaks take. Also, people who smoke tend to have twice as many sick days, have higher insurance rates, more medical comorbidity, their children have more medical problems. So from a financial point of view, which is how most CEOs think, it's logical. We should be helping employees to quit. So it's a little bit of a technical slide as far as the researchers in the room, but I think it's very applicable to those of you who are clinicians in the room. You could help us. You could help us do better. So when there's a field that's been around for a while, but maybe not as visible, called Dissemination and Implementation Science Research, DNI. So this slide outlines what they think about all the time. So what are we going to disseminate? What are the evidence-based practices? With tobacco, there's a ton of them. Seven FDA-approved medications in the US, many psychosocial treatments that work, UCSD, invented the quit line, which is now all over every state in America, uh, offering a free resource for people to call in. Mobile technology has now taken over. How is that going to affect our practices in the future, both in monitoring and in providing support? So what's the evidence that exists for those treatments, and how do you know they're doing it? As from the previous talk, they said, you know, things get watered down. So how do we assess fidelity to make sure the evidence-based treatments we're bringing in are the ones out there. And how are you actually going to disseminate and make change at your organization? Again, some of you are going to be leaders, and you have to think about that every day. How are we going to change to do better? How do we improve the quality of our services? How does that work at your organization? Every organization is different. They have different histories. They have different leadership. They have different ways that things work. That's where, as a clinician leader, I came up with the model of addressing tobacco through organizational change with the influence and help of many others, like John Slade, when I was in New Jersey uh, working in the tobacco area. Then there are 61 implementation models, so there's no shortage of options. And there's a great website, dissemination-implementation.org, uh, in which you can see all the 61 models and decide which one might be best for you. So those models tend to be the kind of theoretical way of organizing. Then, of course, what are the outcomes? Not only the patient care outcomes at the end, but in the short run, are there other outcomes that are important? For tobacco, this is the gold standard in the US, the uh, Public Health Service Guidelines, uh, since 2008. Uh, counseling works, meds work. In America, 97% of people on medications don't get counseling for smoking cessation. Yet it doubles your quit rate. Why don't we do that? Why don't we bring in quit lines, anything for free? The American Psychiatric Association has treatment guidelines adapted for people with psychiatric problems. There are other good uh, studies that are available. For the motivated patient who wants to quit, seven medications, five of them are nicotine replacements, bupropion, varenicline. 
There are excellent psychosocial treatments that equal meds when done with fidelity. So even if you don't have any money, of resources for medications, you could still deliver high quality care. Now for working with people with mental health or addiction problems, and I've worked again with opiate addicts, methadone settings, alcohol, cocaine, as well as schizophrenia, depression, bipolar, et cetera. All those different psychiatric problems matter differently. Most of them will see stress management and weight in America as two important factors they worry about. Also, many have low self-efficacy. They've tried, it didn't work, they didn't get much help. Uh, maybe they weren't even using the medicines appropriately. Many of them tend to be severe when it comes to tobacco use disorder. When I was a young doctor and I would sit out in the outside talking with my patient and they were smoking, I said, they smoke differently. They smoke to big puffs, short periods of time between the puffs, and they smoke all the way down to the butt. They must smoke differently, I thought. Studies have subsequently shown that's true. Most doctors don't know what I'm gonna say next. There's about 13 milligrams in each cigarette. The average person breathes in about one milligram of nicotine in those cigarettes. People with schizophrenia breathe in almost three milligrams for the same cigarette because they're more effective and efficient. And sometimes you get surprised. In America, Korean American men is the highest minority group of smokers. They smoke like people with schizophrenia very effectively and often only report 10 cigarettes to confuse the doctor, but they're still getting more than a pack a day. People often also don't have the support or maybe they even live with others who use. Oh, and the last item when there was tobacco, smoking affects the medication blood levels of many psychiatric medications, but also other medical medications. Anything that goes through the 1A2 isoenzyme of the P450 system, Haldol, Prolixin, Thorazine, Melaril, Clozapine, to name a few, Olanzapine, some of the older antidepressants, some of the benzodiazepines. Our biggest problem is there's less literature, evidence-based approaches for people who have lower motivation to quit. So this has been one area of my own focus in my psychosocial treatment development, which is different than dissemination and implementation. Here's where you're trying to create something new. Personalized feedback, not just any feedback. The dare scare of telling them lots of things could happen. Nobody believes they'll get lung cancer. But if they blow into a carbon monoxide meter and see a score of 15, see the color go from green to yellow to red, see the Geiger, the, the sound go, doo -doo -doo -doo. okay, sound, red, number, it's my body, something's wrong. One of the most powerful tools we have. And yet how many of you have ever used a CO meter? About five hands went up. NIDA, NIH has a great mechanism for creating new treatments. Stage one, 1A, one 1B. One you have a good idea, you're a clinician. You create a manual so others know what you're doing. You create fidelity scales so we can observe a tape and assure that somebody's doing the same thing. We create a training program. We try to implement it and see that there's some outcomes. We then do a randomized control trial. That gets you a million dollars in stage one. And then the stage two, three, and four are more expansive after you have more data. This is an example of one you could go Google online that we offer for free. Learning about healthy living, just put that in your Google search, you'll get a manual. You could use that with your patients. 
Oh, of course everything changes, yet it's all the same. So the electronic nicotine delivery system ends. In America, we're just watching cigarettes become less and less popular. The tobacco industry is even giving up on it. They're going to allow the FDA to lower the amount of nicotine in cigarettes to maybe a half a milligram. That's even less that you get out of your one out of 13 ratio. Everybody will switch to ends. We're seeing kids about one out of 50% are picking up ends and not a cigarette in the US. That little USB looking thing, they can sneak right into class. And people are less aware of those products. There are public health service guidelines also for clinical approaches. Think of your own clinical system. Do you identify tobacco users? Do you train staff? Do you give them access to resources? I've been doing a number of different kinds of work globally. My most current fun project is the far left open dialogue. We just translated it into French. So anybody who wants to be collaborative, I have a French version now. Happy to work with you. Open Dialogue comes out of Finland. It's a family-based intervention model that oftentimes in America we don't really bring in the families for either addiction or mental health treatment. And yet the power of strengthening families, <coughs> providing the needed support, whatever your family is, it might not be your family of origin. The mission model in the middle is a project that I'm doing across the US with homeless, with homelessness, where we see many getting up in the criminal justice system and most have mental health and addiction problems. Our mission model is now the model for the US in the veterans affairs system. So you could Google that, missionmodel.org. The most recent project that's like ATOC, that's a derivative, is working with pregnant moms. We thought it would be a project on depression, or at least one of my mentees thought it would be. I said, oh no, you're gonna see lots of opiates, lots of alcohol, and you're gonna want to be prepared to help the obstetrician in that area. So you could Google McPat for moms if that is your area of interest. Reaim is a model that I've used a lot for my own, one out of those 61 options, and there's the website on the bottom if you want to learn more about other models. So the re-aim model is how far out is the reach? Who are you reaching to? Effectiveness, how do I know that the intervention would be effective? Adoption, uh, how do I develop uh, the organizational support to bring that into that setting? How do you adopt it? The tobacco work, when I brought it into China, and we're in Chengdu, I call it the Worcester of China, that's because I was doing that in Massachusetts. It's where all the hot, spicy food is in the middle of China. Wonderful people, wonderful area, high rates of smoking. Surgeons smoking while they're washing up before they go into surgery. In the wash area. We learned a lot of how to adapt this into China. It's way different. The open dialogue, we've adapted it. Now it's in 12 languages. Each one of those represents a country or more, and we've had to adapt it to those cultures. And it started in Finland, which is a fairly homogenous culture. Way different when we're bringing in Atlanta and Grady Hospital. So the model I had developed addressing tobacco through organizational change thinks about the patient, thinks about the staff, and also the actual environment of the setting. Are you allowed to smoke in the buildings, outside of the buildings? Are th is there signage? Do staff smoke with patients kind of questions? Do you have a website? We have a 10-step model that follows a typical diffusion theory model of preparation, implementation, and trying to sustain things. Like most change management strategies, you got to have strong leadership, and not just from the top down, but in the middle. And you need to also have clear communication. Think about how many times as a leader you've tried to change something. You have to communicate over and over again. How do you monitor outcomes? 
Continuous quality improvement is going to get you to look at some of the barriers. From our current uh, NIH study, these are, if you look at the far left, you can see lack of training, lack of reimbursement, lack of time, treatment won't work, clients won't comply, clients are not interested. Those are the common reasons staff give for why we can't address tobacco in a mental health or addiction setting. So what do you see in your system? How often do, you, do, do your patients get help with quitting smoking? Perhaps some of you even smoke. Perhaps you have an opportunity to see if that could be something to change yourself. Culture's changing in the US, but these are still some of the factors, time pressure, lack of training, and finances. It's so interesting, tobacco addiction is the only addiction in mental health settings where we know it's not, to, where we think it's stress management versus tobacco withdrawal. A heroin addict knows when they're in withdrawal. When they're feeling anxious and a little cognitively impaired, they shoot up. They don't say, oh, I need this for stress management. They know they're in withdrawal. So currently there's big gaps. Most of the programs we start with, we look in their charts, they don't document, they don't provide treatment, their physicians don't, or nurses don't provide medication treatments. So the baseline is zero, or close to zero, and then we do the intervention and, and things get better. These were some of the system barriers. We've talked about some of them, the resources, the knowledge to have, um, limited formularies, staff tobacco use, all those are things that get in the way. These are some of the projects that I've been involved with using this model. We started in New Jersey in the uh, late 1990s uh, doing research in this area with 30 residential addiction programs, all mandated by the state to go tobacco-free grounds and all offering no treatment at that time. From the evidence from that, we got an NIH grant, the NIDA study, to do this in a more rigorous way. Then we got the VA to help us with funding. The book on the right is one that you might, if you're interested, uh, this was the first time the Department of Defense and the VA came together to look at a common health problem of cigarette consumption. How do you engage the consumers, an important part of dissemination and implementation research? We also worked in the state of Connecticut, creating a network working with outpatient providers. Uh, in Massachusetts, we worked with state hospitals. Globally, we've worked in China primarily, but very open to any other partnerships. So give me a reason to come back to Paris. So, uh, in my articles, you can see more about the model itself, but I'll quickly go through it. There are five pre preparatory stages. How do you create a sense of urgency that this is important, that we should address this? Creating leaders. We use a champion model at the local agency. We then also do a baseline assessment of how ready is this organization to change? Everybody's different. We help them write out initial change plan and communicate, communicate, communicate. Because we know they're gonna have to answer to their staff. Why are we doing this? Why are we doing it now? How's this gonna impact me? Sometimes I'm a smoker, why should I do this? So our assessment at baseline I think is very important. We look at the, we talk to patients, we look at chart records, we talk to staff, we get a sense of attitudes, we've developed a survey to look at attitudes in a structured way. Um, we're also curious about the positive things of an agency. What have they done that worked well in the past? Do they have anybody trained in tobacco? The implementation stage has three, uh, where we look at patient goals, staff goals, and organizational ones. It's easy to start change, but how do you continue it? 
So how, what policies and procedures should be in place? How do you normalize things? Build it into people's job descriptions, expectations, change the electronic health record, or other templates where people will have to answer questions about this topic. How do you keep it going? In a study, these would be typical kind of aims that you would put. Because of time, I won't go through the detail, but uh, we're curious about how the impact of the model. Will people pick up the approach? Will they follow it? Will they be able to bring in evidence-based treatments? Uh, will it make a difference? This is from the current study where we've seen differences about clients. So clients want to quit smoking. They know it's dangerous. Our staff didn't think they wanted to quit, didn't think they were ready. In our New Jersey study, we found nothing. It reminds me, I went, to, I went to Ireland. I just happened to be there the weekend. They were going to say no smoking in the pubs. They expected riots in the Irish pubs. Nothing happened. Same with when we went tobacco-free in mental health and addiction settings. Nothing happened. People just said, okay, the new rules. <clears throat> Here's an example of how we increased treatment services, kind of comments that people had. They were appreciative that they were actually being helped. This was a study of about 1,300. Then we had the NIDA study. We showed that knowledge went up, barriers went down, People's attitudes shifted positively. More services were provided at those agencies. Even the cli clients saw the same. They had more knowledge, better attitudes, and more services. There was this interesting pattern. This is sort of like when the pharmaceutical reps come and see a doctor. They know some of you are early adopters. That's the first blue line. So we know some agencies, they're ready. You give them knowledge, they boom right into it, prescribe the meds in this area. Others want a little bit more information, and then you finally get an upswing on some otherwise. In our Connecticut study, uh, this one we had a, a network of agencies and providers. Uh, here we had over 1,700 patients uh, participate. 44% tried to quit. Many of these never had tried before. 58% tried a medication. 58% reduced their use. 50% were ready. We saw changes. Six out of nine of these agencies went tobacco-free campus. Last two slides. So, lessons learned. At this kind of agency, we saw better outcomes if the leadership was engaged and they empowered champions if they had lengthier participation in the training, if they transitioned to a tobacco-free campus that was consistent with this value. It's so interesting to me, in methadone settings, we won't allow people to drink alcohol, but you can smoke. The same with the trigger. Other lessons that we've learned that really having these tools will help empower your agency to make these differences. That patients and staff do ultimately find these to be good experiences, even though there may be a transition. It really needs to vary by site, country, culture. I'm sure in France, as you all are trying to address tobacco, as I see on a national level, there'll be differences here than in America. What's the role of the patient in the process in addition to the physician? This will require organizational change, but it can be done, and we've seen it in the studies in America, even in China, uh, in their work, and so uh, I look forward to hearing your questions. Avez-vous des questions Bon. Um, at um, the different states, um, engage funding to train a psychiatrist 
to, to manage the smoking cessation among institutions. So different American states yeah. and to, to facilitate uh, um, access to, to give financial coverage and et cetera. Yeah, so uh, the, the question was, uh, how does it vary by states in America? So uh, interestingly, America has different ways that things vary. If you're a physician and you have certain requirements, it's less by state. It tends to be a national requirement built in. So like in the mid-90s, we made it a national requirement that psychiatrists had to learn addiction and they had to have a certain amount of hours in their curriculum dedicated to learning about addiction. Uh, once in a while, a state will have a unique requirement, uh, particularly with the opiate crisis in our country, they've been mandating specific curriculums around that. Uh, so training is often less by state, but more by national changes. Uh, however, clinical services, particularly for the poor, are more different by states, whether it's in Medicaid or Medicare. And so in this area in America, Medicare, which goes across for the elderly, uh, that now does have national standards on providing counseling, support, and funding, and medications. Most Medicaid for the poor uh, offer some medication options. It varies by state uh, how uh, rigorous it is. But really, the intervention level of what I was talking about today is your clinical program. It's not the state. It's what happens at your agency. What could happen differently at your agency? And it's really, even though I've talked about tobacco, it, this, everything I just said could be for a different problem. It was just one that when I started my career was interesting. In the mid 80s, nobody was looking at tobacco. So it was curious to me why even people died with mental health problems in the mid 80s we didn't know in America. It wasn't until the middle 90s that the first paper came out and said, patients with mental health problems die of cancer, lung cancer, they die of cardiac disease. And the whole paper didn't mention tobacco once. So you can see the kind of cultural shift, even in the researchers, that needed to be shifted. So, uh, Well, hi, sorry. Uh, maybe it's going to be a very naive question at first, but I wanted to look up uh, I wanted to ask you what was the reaction of the, pas the patients at first when you like campus free is like quite unbelievable for me. I'm coming from Morocco where there is no law around this. You can f smoke wherever you want. Yeah. And second, for example, in the place I'm working in, we we put in place at least for kind of prevention, uh, controlling cigarette uh, intake. Like uh, they're only allowed to have one cigarette per hour. Well, what is your point of view about that? Well, we've come a long way, baby. Virginia Slim's advertisement. So when I was a resident at UCLA, a good program, I was trained to give one cigarette for good behavior and two for really good behavior in group to the patient. So we gave as behavioral reinforcers. So we've gone way beyond that. So now when patients go into hospitals, they're put on nicotine replacement, they're offered to patch gum if they would like it. In a contained environment, when you know you don't have an option, people's craving goes down. We know that from heroin addicts who go into prison. They have less craving, they go out of prison, they have more craving. So there are ways to manage it. Uh, often you have to manage the staff's behavior more so than the patient's behavior. Patients in America go through lots of shifts. There may be people who are argumentative in the beginning, but then they shift. Uh, the families of people with serious mental illness, the National Alliance of Mentally Ill, they used to fight me in the early 90s. Stay focused on the important topic. Then when they saw the data that their loved ones were dying, they completely shifted. And they have a strong policy recommending that programs offer this. Mm -hmm. And so, um, our experience has been with leadership, with a plan, uh, all 30, we had almost all 30 of the New Jersey addiction programs go tobacco free and that was 
20 years ago. So it's definitely possible, and I'd be happy to uh, speak with you or email you and give you information. On a une dernière question parce qu'on est pressé par le temps. Reste, non, une dernière. Thank you, Dr. Sidonis, for your nice speech. Uh, we are talking about people who are suffering mental, <laughs> mental health disorders. Uh, in this case, it's people that are suffering dual disorders, mental health disorders and tobacco use disorder, no to tobacco user. Right. You are promoting abstinence for them. And this kind of uh, strategy was failed in patients who are suffering from opioid use disorder or another, an, another kind of addiction. What do you think about the strategi est strategies of about uh, harm reduction as uh, uh, electronic uh, nicotine by, uh, uh, by special uh, device or include the new uh, device from Philip Morris is uh, called ICOS, is, uh, is heating tobacco at low temperature because probably is that demonstrate is necessary to demonstrate that but you do you think that we can promote abstinence uh, at only unique strategy for them uh, great question the question was is abstinence the only outcome no i have no problem with someone having a different outcome we meet people where they're at just because you can't smoke in a certain building doesn't mean you can't smoke somewhere else so when we offer help If a person wants to try ENDS, I can't prescribe it. So if they don't want, if they want to try electronic cigarette, we're open. We may find out years from now that that wasn't a healthy choice, but today we don't know that, like we know with cigarettes. And it's so easy in America for them to <laughs> access the ENDS at any little uh, gas station, any little store, you can get these products. So abstinence is mostly in the context of respect to other people. So if most people aren't smoking and you're in a context where you're going to trigger that other person to want to smoke potentially, there's clear data on the health risk of walking into a smoke-filled room or setting if you have a cardiac disease. So no, we're very uh, open to a wider range as far as health outcomes. In fact, one of my slides was showing from the Connecticut program that many reduced their cigarette number from 17 to 13. So it was a reduction in number, and that was an okay outcome. So I'm glad you asked that question so I can clarify. I, I'm, I want to meet people where they're at. Now, in the setting of where they impact other people's lives, that's a different question. But if on your own, in your house, you want to smoke, or in your setting, uh, that is a choice that people have. The real, real thing is, though, we don't give them the right or choice to quit. We don't offer them help. The psychiatrist doesn't know how to help them, nor do they know how to prescribe the meds. So really the issue is if it's a level playing field, like every other American, more will try to quit. The data is also clear. They say, we want to quit. We would like help with quitting. So to me, you ask a brilliant question. And I hope I can answer it, that there's a wide range. But the biggest uh, comment I want to make is, do you, with integrity, with ethics, can you, and not you, but can we say that we really offer people the opportunity to quit? Bon. Do we? Bravo.